Welcome back, everyone. This is Auction for the Soul. This week's Pasha is Pashad Ve'era. It's also dedicated in gratitude to Hashem for Rabbi Reuben Abramov's classes, the work of Chazak and the Savra Synagogue from the Sachs family. Uh, special shout out to Gila, who is watching with us right now, um, and her uh, wonderful husband, Keith. These are two Nishamot that have so much power, so much potential. They're both Mavakshi Hashem. They're both individuals that uh, want to grow, want to do what is right. Um, they, they make me very, very proud, and it's an honor to have them as part of our Kehillah. Um, okay, uh, this one's for you, Gila. So, Parshat, <laughs> Parshat tells us, begins with, elukim el Moshe, And God uh, speaks to Moshe. Now, this is very important, because this is not the same kind of speaking that has happened up until now. Well, just, let's just take a step back. We just started the second book of the five books of Moses the book of Exodus, the book of Shemot. If you missed uh, the beginning intro, please go back to last week. Uh, I definitely recommend listening to the conversation about the names. It's very, very important. And God says to Abraham, Ba'ere el Abraham, and he appears to Abraham and to Yitzchak and to Yaakov, Bekel Shakai, in the special name of God. And remember, the names of God are not just arbitrary uh, sounds that are used to describe God. They have very specific meaning. Ushmi Hashem, or Yud Kei Vav Kei, Lo Nadati Lahem. In the name of the Havaya, the name of God that, is, that we use when we say Baruch Atah Hashem, that name of God, he did not, God did not disclose to the Avot. Um, and it was through the name of Shakai that, um, that, uh, that Hashem revealed himself to the, Avot, to the Avot itself. But Moshe, he gets a higher level, a higher expression, a higher relation to Borei Olam, to God, and he is, knows God by the name of Yud Kei Vav Kei. Okay. Now, this is very interesting. So up until now, we know last week, the Jewish people, we know they're in bondage, they're enslaved, and now Moshe is finally take up the task to go ahead and confront uh, Paro, to let my people go, free them, let them be free. And he's about to bring all of the plagues onto Mitzrayim. We know that the Parshat Va'era, we, there's a little, bit of a, a little bit of a mnemonic over here. The Vav and the Aleph and Va'era represent the number seven, and that's a way to remind, to remind you that there are seven of the ten plagues are in this week's Parsha. In next, week, next week's Parsha, Parshat Bo, which is only two letters, to a, a bet and aleph, which is numerically three, and the last three of the makot are in next week's parasha. Okay, so we have seven of the ten in this week's parasha. And Hashem is telling you, by the way, just remember that I connected to you through Yud Kei Vav Kei and not Kel Shakai, which is interesting, okay? And I'll tell you why. We know that the name Shakai, okay, comes from the words Sha'amar Dai. Shakai represents the relationship that we have with God in nature. Okay, it has to do with God as the force of power. Shamar Dai, that God created boundaries in the world. That it is not just a, hey, I'll do whatever I want to do. Specifically, it is a God that creates the, a world of order, right? A, a world of perfection and precision. The name, the name of Yud Kei Vav Kei is different. The name Shakai represents God in the material world that you and I re, re, uh, relate to on a, on a regular basis. But Shem Havaya, that name has to do with God being intimately involved in our lives. The name Shakai has to do with just God the scientist. He created the world, and here he is. Here's his world. You look at the world, you'll find God. But the world of, the, uh, the world of Haya, Hove, Uyiye, the world of the past, present, and the future, what God is saying to Moshe that I did not relate to the Avot in the same way I'm relating to you. I am talking to you in the most personal way that I can. I'm an infinite being, and I am relating to you in the past, present and the future, God is not bound by time or space. God is infinite. He's infinite. And here he is, I'm telling you, I'm relating to you in the simplest way I possibly can. Past, present, the future. Why? Because I love you. I care about you. Okay? <clears throat> but there's more over here. That the Avot represented um, individuals that were trying to prove to the world of God's existence through nature. And Moshe is not doing that anymore. He's not trying to look at, look at nature, look at the water, look at the sky, look how perfect it is, and you'll find God. Moshe is showing the world that there is a bore olam, not only through nature, but through the miraculous, through a guiding hand in history. Okay, that you and I, that our lives, irrespective of the challenge that you find yourselves in, is being guided by God. Why did this person 
have to be so mean? Why did this person, you know, not keep to their word? It's all about response, okay? We are responsible for one thing, not the, des- not, not, the, not the destination. I cannot control where I end up at the end of my and your 120 years of life. I have no control over that. I'll tell you what I have control. I have control over how I'm going to respond to the circumstances that I find myself in. That's what this parasha is. Okay, there are five times where there are five plagues. The first five plagues, they come out, and as a result of these five plagues, and uh, uh, Moshe comes to Paro each time, and he says, Hashem, why am I doing this? Like, this is such a waste of time. Like, you want to go ahead and let your people free. I'm making things worse. Why are we allowing this to keep going on? Okay, we have the four expressions of redemption in this week's parasha, which I don't want to get into. Moshe says to Hashem, you know, uh, find somebody else. Don't let me be this guy. And now the redemption begins, and the plagues are about to come out. Okay, we have the first plague, the plague of blood, the second plague, the frogs, frogs here, frogs there, frogs are jumping everywhere. Okay, and the third plague, the lice, and that's still not enough to go ahead and, uh, and break Paro down. The fourth plague, you have the wild beasts, and as the parasha moves on, you have the fifth plague, right? You have this massive <coughs> <coughs> epidemic, right? Where all the livestock, all the horses, all the donkeys and the camels and the cattle and the flock, everything is dying around them, okay? And it's at this point that any normal human being would break down and capitulate and say, God, hands up, I am done. Take your people and I, I, I don't want these Jewish people here. Just take them and go. But that's not what happens here, right? That, this is something very unexpected over here, that Paro somehow finds the way of being super stubborn where he is not giving in. He does not want to give in. So listen to what Pasuk says over here. Uh, 7-3. The Yasu Ken Hachatumim. This is right after the frogs, the, uh, the, the sorcerers of Egypt. Okay, they challenge. They are also able to bring these uh, 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 frogs onto the land of Egypt. And so Paro's like, this is just a parlor trick. I'm not going to be moved by this. Okay. He says, I want you to go, you know, go, go back to your God and tell him to remove these, uh, these uh, uh, frogs. Me for my people. And I'll, and I'll send your people away. He's about to capitulate and then no. Bechazek lev paro. God goes ahead, and the word chazak is there. Uh, it means that he uh, hardened, but really it means over here that he strengthened. And we see this three times happening in the Pashiot. That each time God is being mechazek, he's hardening his heart. And we have to ask a very important question here. Why is God hardening paro's heart? We have a very deep philosophical problem with this. right? He's hardening his heart means two things. One way of understanding is he's taking away his free will. And the other hand, another way of understanding is that he's actually giving him back his free will. Because you and I, if we saw five miracles happening right here, right now, I'd have no choice. I'd say, ah, believe. Right? It's so obvious. Like, here's God. He's proving himself to you. He's breaking down nature. But that's not what's happening over here. God's saying, no, I want to give you back your free will. I'm going to give you, I'm going to be, I'm going to be mechazek. I'm going to harden your heart so you don't lose your free will. Because ultimately, I want you to believe. And everyone, the philosophers, are dealing with this question. I don't understand. To be a human being, by definition, means having free will. Now, let me ask you a question. Are you more animal or more human? If you had to put a number to your animal side versus your human side, what would it be? So you know what Darwin said? Darwin said that man is 99% animal. Do you know what the rabbis say? The rabbis say that Darwin was being optimistic, that we're way more than 99%. We're 99.9% animal. What makes us human? What makes you not a giraffe or a dog or a cat or a bear or a bird is that you can choose to take a different path. Every other creature, every other animal is stuck in a certain plane right? It it lives on this horizontal plane. It is flatlined. It can never be more than the plane that it's on, okay? It's stuck. 
A human being has the power of breaking through and being whatever he wants. And the only way you and I can do this is through our free will. With our free will, we could exercise what it means to be a human being. And it's so profound that this conversation is happening right here in this week's parasha. And I'll tell you why. You see, this isn't just, oh, God freeing his people. These parashiot is the evidence that there is a God that is intimately involved in your life and in my life. That he came out of his hiding space, so to speak, and he put his finger into the world and everyone saw it. This is where we get the strength to stand up to the people of the world, the anti-Semites, saying, yeah, well, we know we had this experience. It's where on Pesach, you and I say, Avadim hayinu we were slaves. And had we not been freed by God, you and I would still be slaves to Paro. Because the, the slavery of Egypt wasn't what you think. It wasn't Jews locked in shackles, in, 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 in handcuffs, with taskmasters just beating them all day. That wasn't the slavery of Mitzrayim. The Jews had no problem. They could endure that. They could sit there and they could take the beating. You know, there's a, a study that was done in Colorado where um, we know that in, in the months that lead up to the winter time, there's an increase of people going to jail. And they're all going to jail for certain crimes, for small crimes that allow you, they, they, they put you in jail for 90 days. So what happens? Why are they doing this in Colorado? Many poor, poor people know or people that are like, you know, homeless people know that Colorado has the best jail system in the world. It's also the only jail system in the world that will give you cigarettes. So hey, I do a small crime, I go to jail for 90 days, I have a bed to sleep in for free, I have all my meals catered for, I'm okay, and then I get cigarettes too, amazing. I will go ahead and commit a small crime and I'll beg to be thrown into jail for 90 days. This is part of the complaints when, when, when the Jewish people are leaving Mitzrayim. What are they saying? Oh, take us back to Egypt. We remember all the fish we had. We remember all the food we had. It was so good in jail. The slavery of Egypt was a slavery of the mind. How much of a slave are you and I to the culture that you and I find ourselves in? What does it truly mean to be free? Paro, he saw this. He's like, Believe in God. Believe in Hashem. Do it. Keep the mitzvot. Hashem had to be mechazekim, the opposite. We're begging to go ahead and be in a position where we could see the miracles of Paro. And Paro says, hey guys, do it. But you and I right now, the place that you and I are in right now, this place is the place where you and I can choose to be the happiest, best version of ourselves. Okay, I'm going to give you three principles that I want you to remi remem uh, rem remind yourselves of or to live by. I just taught this to a group of uh, young married couples, and um, I think it's important to, I think it fits very nicely into the parasha. Okay, these are the three fundamental principles for building a relationship with anyone. Rule number one, the more you can choose your relationship, the more meaningful that relationship is. The more you choose Who's the first relationship you really choose? It's not your parents, that's forced upon you. But at some point as an adult, you have to choose as to whether or not you want to have a relationship with your parents. But the first relationship you really choose is your spouse. You're choosing to commit yourself to them. The more that choice, the more you exercise that choice, the more meaningful that relationship is. All the more so, my friends, with God. The more you choose to have a relationship with Bore Olam, the more meaningful that relationship will become. Number two, the one that loves the most in any relationship is not in control of that relationship. The one that loves the least is in control of a relationship. And that means between you and your, and your relationship with God, who's in control of that relationship? You're in control of that relationship because God loves you infinitely more than you can love Him. And therefore, your relationship with God depends on your ability to choose, going back to number one. Number one is if you, the, more, the, the relationship you choose, that's the one that's the most meaningful. Number two, the one that loves the least is in control. And therefore, when it comes to you and God, who's in control? You're in control. Ready? You and your parents. Who are in control of that relationship? You or your parents. Your parents love you infinitely more than you do, and therefore, you're in control of that relationship, not your parents. It's like a weird twist. Last, and not least, the more similar two things are, the deeper that relationship can get. Okay? The more I work on trying to understand my spouse, the more I try to give to her in the way that she needs to receive, the more similar we become, the more deeper that connection is. Same is true, my friends, with God. 
How do you become similar to God? Oh, it's simple. There's something called, um, something called mitzvot, something called Torah. Torah is the book that was given to man so that we can emulate God. The more similar I become to God, the more meaningful my relationship with God becomes. So the parsha is telling you about this. Parsha over here, this week's parsha, is telling you the opposite of what every other scientific you know, discovery of the last hundred years have told you. Okay? Marx said that history is formed by the play of economic forces, and therefore you are just the response to your, your economy. Your economy will determine your behavior. Okay? Um, because, because we are all, ba- we are all an expression of our, uh, our unconscious desires, was what Freud said. All we are is what our subconscious tells us, right? The neo-Darwinians, uh, they say that, you know, uh, that we do what we do because people who behave this way in the past, you know, survived, and therefore these are genetics that have to do with survival, and that's why we do what we do. And most recently, you have the neuroscientists who say that using fMRI scans, right, our, our brains register all kinds of decisions up to seven seconds before, and therefore we're not consciously aware of what we do, and therefore you and I really don't have free will. But all four are saying the same thing. You and I are just a sophisticated animal with no choice. And we agree, except for the last part. We are a sophisticated animal, but what makes us human, what allows us to be godly is our choice. Choosing is what makes us godly. And this is exactly what this whole pasha is about. God wants the world to choose to believe. He doesn't want to force you to believe. Because an overwhelming force, if I go ahead and I overwhelm you with my logic or my charisma, right, that doesn't prove anything. But if I give you the space to express yourself, to make your own choices, that is really you. What does it mean to be you? It's very simple. Take everything that your life represents, the challenges of your life, the struggles, the hardships that you find yourself in, choose to overcome them. That is you expressing the best part of you. The things that happen automatically, you have a tendency to exercise and eat well and care for yourself. That's not greatness. That's your animalistic self. You know, animals take care of cats, lick themselves like they're clean. You know what I'm saying? That's part of a subconscious behavior. But your ability to overcome um, an urge, your ability to feel a sense of, to work on feeling gratitude, to having savlanut, to be patient, to be loving and caring when, you, when you're feeling disappointed instead, to do the opposite of what your intuition tells you because intellectually that's the right thing to do. This is what it means to be godly. This is what it means to be connected to the name of God of Yud Kei Vav Kei. The name of Havaya, the name of God is going beyond the, beyond the boundaries. The beyond the boundaries is easy. All animals operate within boundaries. But you and I have the ability of connecting to something called Selem Elohim, the image of the Almighty. We have the ability of breaking free from the constraints. To be freed from Egypt means... To be B'nai Harin means, to be free people, means that you and I have the ability to choose. And the more you and I choose, the more we flex our free will muscles, not by allowing us ourselves to become auto-rote kind of people, automatrons that's doing exactly what our nature tells us to do. The more we flex our free will muscles, the more, the more we become free. It took 10 plagues of breaking down the will of the people to give them the opportunity then to go back and choose it. And we see, by the way, no matter how much God showed to the people, no matter how much was revealed, they still suffered from that free will choice. And ultimately, they often chose what was simple and easy. Let's go back to Egypt, Moshe. This is too hard. I gotta keep these mitzvot. I don't wanna do this, this is too hard. I wanna go back, I wanna go back. Take me back, I wanna go back. I want it to be easy. I don't don't wanna suffer. Moshe himself, uh, what what are we doing this for? Moshe and Aaron, going back and forth, back and forth, trying to free the people so that you have the ability of being the best you. Don't allow our society to tell you that you have no free will. What a mistake. The most beautiful thing about being a human is that any one of us at any point can choose to turn around the situation that we're in and make it a thousand times better. It's through these choices 
that we connect to the divine. It's through these choices that we become more similar to the Bore Olam. I want to end with the following. You know that there's a, a lot of conversation this week's parasha. Rashi mentions it, that there's a, a flip for the first time where it doesn't say Moshe and Aaron. It says Aharon and Moshe, right? And everyone asks, well, why are we flipping it? Why are we talking about Aaron and Moses? We know that Moses was the leader over here. Moses was the greatest. greatest. And we'll see this interchange between Aaron and Moshe and Moshe and Aaron to teach you a very profound lesson. And that lesson is, is that we say that Moshe and Aaron are equal. And you should be bothered by that statement that Rashi makes. How could Moshe and Aharon be equal if Moshe was the greatest Navi that ever lived? The greatest prophet? Had most the clarity that he was, God reveals himself in a way that Moshe did not have to go into a sleep or into a trance. He always had connection to Borei Olam. How can they be equal? And the answer has to do with our potential. You see, what makes... And by the way, the, the Rambam says this, that every single person could be as great as Moshe. How could I be as great as Moshe if there could never be a Navi that ever walked on his, that will never walk the planet as great as Moshe? And the answer is very simple. You have to do you. Aharon reached a level of perfection based on Aharon's own metrics. The measure of greatness has to do with your own potential. Moshe reached his potential. It's not my potential. But I can be as great as Moshe if I just become me. And all of us can become the best version of ourselves if we just work on becoming the best us. Forget about Moshe and what he did. If you do you, you too will be part of this system of, of, of storytelling where we're going to tell back the story of this one individual who reached their full potential. How do you do it? By choosing. What are we aiming for? We're aiming to become godly. How do I become godly, my friends? It's so easy. All you've got to do is follow the laws and the commandments of the Torah itself. The more similar I am to God, the more meaningful my relationship with God will be. How do I get there? By choosing that relationship. Don't do what's easy. Do what is right. What is right often has to do with doing what is more difficult and challenging. You want to go the easy route? Hatzlacha Raba, you can, but you will not express the best of you. You will not reach the level of Moshe. I want to wish you all a week of happiness and success a week of greatness, a week where you're able to see the hand of God standing behind you, literally cheering and rooting you on, or where you're able to have the clarity to recognize that the challenges that you're facing are all the small hurdles you need to express the best of you. May you see the, that bracha of your, your awesomeness impacting the world around you, bringing good into a world that all too often feels so dark. How do we dispel the darkness? By exercising your free will. You don't want to get to a place where God has to remove your ability to have the free will to be the best you. That happens after we die. This world is a world of b'chat and b'chaim. Choose to live. Shabbat shalom, everybody.